Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, and why don't we get started by, why don't you tell us about um, how you first became involved in the revolution last year on the Maidan, when you first went, what you did, what you saw, what you thought. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. First of all, it's a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here. Uh, not only in this great university, but also I think in this historical room, I like it very much. And it's a great place. It's uh, probably the most distinctive and interesting place uh, I've been talking in for the last year. I, I've been to Cambridge, to Oxford, to Sorbonne, to Harvard, to, to LSE. But this one is very cozy and I like it. Thank you for, <laughs> for, for being different. <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, uh, my voice is not as good as usual as well because I've, I had a very hard schedule. We, we were touring and for the last couple of months I'm singing almost all, every day. So sorry for <coughs> sometimes I have sore throat. And a great singer. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't for, uh, I, I didn't no, tell that for, 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 to, to get a compliment, but just in case, I, in case somebody can't hear me. Uh, now, uh, Thank you, Mercy, for the question. Uh, having asked me this question, you meant that everybody know that what is Ukrainian revolution and Maidan and everything else. Is it correct? Because if not, then probably I'll tell some word before. Okay, how all it started. Uh, we gained the independence in 1991. And for last 24 years, or especially 23 years, before 2014, we were like coming back and forth uh, in political or geopolitical or sense. Are we a part of Europe or are we a part of, like, let's say, I will call it Eastern civilization. And politicians uh, use this fact of, uh, uh, use this as a flag, always in their own interests. Some used European flag, some Euro used Russian flag, but it was more of a manipulation. And for 24 years, we were, like, as a nation, we were like, torn apart, like, between these two concepts. And uh, when you have that kind of tensions, these tensions always bring you to, to things like riots or uprisings or revolutions. It depends on, you know, on the country, on, on the situation. So what happened in 2014? For the, it was like probably next time, I don't know, 10th or 15th or 20th or whatever time, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian people were promised that finally they were giving to, towards Europe and Ukrainian government in, uh, on behalf and pres the, the former president, the, that time president Yanukovych, decided that he was going to sign all the treaties with the European Union to sign an association. And, and there was a big, big, massive PR company and publicity uh, prior to that, like for half a year, probably a year, that we're going to Europe, we're going to Europe, we're going to Europe. Like, people were like, you know, it's like a new album is coming, you know. You're 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 you're, 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 you're given you're given this uh, this perspective that the new song and now the new single and the next single and, and more and more and more. Finally, uh, the end of November. I don't remember the date. Twenty fourth probably was the date. Shoot. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, twenty twenty fourth or twenty fifth. It should should be the day. Of, 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 of signing a treaty with, with, with the European Union in Vilnius. So everybody, even skeptics, <coughs> even uh, people who knew the situation deeply, everywhere uh, <coughs> almost convinced that the signing uh, uh, would happen. But it didn't. You know, it did. So, a week before they made a U-turn, a week before, and made uh, a big part of society, especially um, Ukrainian, let's say, political elite, or especially pro-European elite, and not only them, but also a big, big uh, 
part of society, like students and people who were pre-European people, made them infuriated. Uh, because they understood that they were treated like fools for, for, for all this year. Because before that, Yanukovych wasn't seen as somebody pre-European. But he, like, the strong publicity, PR, and convincing speeches, and, and even, I mean, not only speeches, but even some, some actions, uh, made people sure that everything would be okay. It didn't happen, you know. Uh, that uh, caused a normal thing, as in normal democratic country. What do they do? When people are angry and disappointed, they go to the street. But they went to the street just to say, to express their disappointment and their, uh, it wasn't even fury. It was, I would say disappointment is the best word. It, it wasn't still fury. It was just, oh, we didn't think you, you, you know, we would screw it up. It was like that. So two, three, four hundred activists came to Maidan, which is a central square <coughs> of Kiev. It's not Times Square, Trafalgar Square, but something like that. Uh, at least we had, uh, at that time, we had as much as the advertisement there advertising as in Times Square. <laughs> so, and the protest, this peaceful protest began. Uh, frankly speaking, you asked me what I did that time. Frankly speaking, I'm not, and I can state it absolutely without any fear, I never was the biggest fan of, of the idea that Ukraine must come, become part of the European Union. I'm, I have different thoughts on this topic. I con I'm convinced that Ukraine should become part of European society, the European civilization. But for me, it's not equal to the European Union. So when that happened at the beginning, I was also disappointed, but it, it, it wasn't like the goal of my life was screwed, you know. It was, I was just disappointed because of, of the actions of our government that made it as usual. And I was certainly okay that students were in the streets, but didn't have any special <coughs> intention to become a leader of their movement because I wasn't standing for European Union, you know. And, but, but it became more and more and more popular, and one day I was asked by student activists to come and to say something to people. Because, you know, somehow they listen to, at least to what I'm saying, and as far as I, as far as I know, also to what I say. And it was important for them to listen to me. So I said, okay, I come here, but I won't talk about European Union, about association, I'll talk about values. So I made my speech. I went to my daughter, it was Thursday, two days before the first uh, clashes with the police, and the first blood, drops of blood uh, appeared. Uh, so I said to them, that, you know, uh, I asked them, do they know what is it to be European? And what do they mean by saying, I want to be European, I want to be part of Europe? And then expressed what is it for me, that it's not uh, geography, because geographically we already are Europe. It's not... Uh, Politically, because I don't think that that's the most important thing to Ukraine. But so, so then what? So I explain, express them that it's values. The first value and the most important, freedom of choice. And the second, the dignity. The dignity. And I said, I stand here for you because you came here for your freedom of choice. I can agree or disagree with you on the topic of European Union. But I strongly support your desire to come and to protest because it's your freedom of choice. And then there were my last words at the end. Uh, my last words were, don't give up and don't be pessimistic. Everything only begins. Unfortunately, not only good things began after that. I, it was not my prediction, it was just rather, I understood that it, <coughs> it wouldn't be as it, it, it wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't make it easy, you know. It, it was some, some, something in the air. I understood that. 
probably my it intuitively probably gut feeling probably I don't know something told me that it wouldn't be so happy as people probably at the very beginning expect. Next two days uh, were tragic, and Saturday after students were beaten, suddenly I already didn't have any second thoughts. I understood that all three people should be there. And suddenly, not only me, fortunately, a million of PEV is for the sake. So Sunday, a million of people were in my dorm. And, uh, uh, and still, still it wasn't clear that, uh, that we would have what we have now. Because all next step, I personally was thinking, okay, now the government, the president will, will think. This time they will think. This time they will make, make it, <coughs> they will be wiser, they will be more clever, and this time they won't screw it. Each next step, worse and worse. Each next step. I still, uh, uh, I was uh, finally, a couple of months ago, asking an interview to explain the logic. I can't explain the logic. I still can't explain. Probably some politicians or analysts who are here who know the history of these uprisings the in, in better how, 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 how usual things go can explain it to me. I can't. I can't explain first why didn't he sign? It was nothing to sign. You know, they, when you sign, it's, it's still not, you know, it, uh, it's not to adopt. You need to, a lot of time to come. If he didn't want to make it happen, just sign. Okay, if you didn't sign, why to beat students? Okay, if somebody made a wrong order and had beaten the students, why not to, to fire those responsible? When not to fire those responsible, why, why to make it even more strong, cruel and cruel? Why to bring uh, armed forces? Each next step, illogical. Each, ne each next step. It's, it was like a special thing to get rid of, of the course. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and finally that happened. So uh, when people say, now many, many people say that it was an illegal, a legitimate change of power, I always ask, okay, what do you, what are you going to do if one day your president escapes or leaves? What are you going to do? So there is no possibility in law to make legitimately, uh, to make him, in, to enforce him somewhere to abdicate, uh, to, how you call it, to to, to resign, yeah, yeah. So what to do? Suddenly somebody like take power, take response, takes responsibility and make things uh, with mistakes or without mistakes is different. But but still, because people, because legit, legitimacy is, is, is a very, uh, you know, it's a tricky thing. You can always argue about that because many, many, many uh, historical, um, precedents in history when you have you know illegitimate formally illegitimate but mentally or morally absolutely legit things that make people feel better and, and make history rolling. So uh, now to conclude I was in Maidan not because I was standing for European Union I was there because I wanted to depend to defend the freedom of these people to say what they want and to defend my freedom to say what I wanted to say. That was my main reason, my main main goal. That was I, what, what was I doing there. And, and on the Maidan, things happened in January and February that seemed unimaginable in October or November. Absolutely. What, how did you see people changing? Do you, do you feel like you were changing during the time you spent there? And the people around you, did you feel like they were changing? It's, it's too hot, yeah? That's why you open it. Probably we'll, we'll try. Yeah, 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 no, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, if, if you can close it, it's okay. I'm okay, I, I'm, I'm afraid somebody else probably will feel too hot. Uh, you, I don't know if there is somebody in this room, except certainly uh, Ukrainians who were at the time in Ukraine, from different countries, 
who do really understand what is it to live in the city when next to your street people are being killed. I never understood what was that uh, before right, all my 30, being 39, I never, after 38 the time, I never, never had this feeling. It's something completely different. Believe me, everybody who is not familiar directly with what, what was going on in Ukraine, it's something different to see it in the movie, to read it in a book, or even to hear it from, from, uh, from you know, stories of your friends or your grandfathers or mothers who were in the war. It's a completely different story. It's absolutely different. And it changes everybody. Uh, I don't believe that there a single person uh, that won't be changed after uh, witnessing or like being like, being there. So suddenly it changed all of us. Uh, me, uh, after I was a big, big fan of history before my gun, but after my gun, I became like let's say history became my religion because now I know. That his history is a fundamental thing, and it's absolutely cruel, and it's absolutely sor uh, sorrowless, and it always works with the same in, in the same. Uh, uh, there are the same rules that work in the world. Now I know that, not theoretically but practically. History was doing its job in Ukraine. It's it was absolutely predictable <laughs> if you were. If you were not that person put inside, but if you were just somebody who know history good and who was at least in the height of, 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 of a bird fly, you know? I mean, illiterate. It was predictable. Because uh, 1991, we didn't gain the independence. We didn't fought for it. We just, we, were, we, we got it for granted, you know? Uh, some people argue with me. Sadly, they say about these movements of, of 40s, of uh, dissidents of 60s, or even uh, students' revolution in 1990. But believe me, that's you can't compare this with the real war for independence. And the most, uh, mostly all developed na nations in the world went through this. Starting from Britain in the 17th century with Cromwell and William Orange and everything, and French Revolution, and America, two, war, two big wars, and you have whatever, Italy with Harry Bali, you have, you, you name it, everybody. So Ukraine were just unlucky to get to this point 100 or 200 per, uh, years later than others. I always say we are, we are lucky that we are earlier than many others still. And many others still didn't get to this point. And uh, sooner or later, it should, it should happen, you know. And, uh, and it happened 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, it changed everybody. Now it's not a question, did it change? But it's a question, how it changed? And is this change uh, <coughs> coherent or different people were influenced differently? That's the most important question. Because if it's coherent, like for example, Japanese defeat in 1945, when nation uh, uh, reconciliation <coughs> and, uh, and you know, like all things they went through made it even stronger, you know? That's one thing. When nation thought differently of different parts of nation, uh, think differently of, of what's going on. That's, that's a problem. And uh, I think that, that the events that passed after were uh, consequences of, of, of our uh, irresponsibility, political, social, and probably personal irresponsibility of all Ukrainians. Because for 24 years, we were doing nothing. I mean, not as we were m making families, we were making our, our own careers, living, studies, uh, selling millions of CDs, some of them. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's different. I mean, 
as a nation, as a social, as a social movement, as 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 as, as an environment of people to see their common future. We we did we didn't do our best. Probably we do we do very little, what and that's what we that these mistakes we pay for them. And what about two thousand four? You were on the Maidan. Two thousand four, it wasn't a revolution. I don't think it was a revolution. It was. It was much more civilized story. It was caused by much less civilized uh, reasons because uh, the elections, I think, they were falsified and people. Came to the, uh, came to the streets once again to to protest that and to to make their choice happen finally. But how it was done, it was much more civilized. And suddenly, the wisdom of that time, President Kuchma, played his role. We can now uh, name him or value him differently. I wouldn't do that now. He was, he acted wise at that specific time. Uh, it could have ended much worse. And I think that many people, uh, let's say, um, shared this success of peaceful end. But I think if not his will, political will, it would have ended differently, as probably as it was now. But it depends on, you see, one person can change many things. He never made, he never gave any <coughs> controversial orders. I mean, he also, uh, there, there were also armed forces with, uh, but also only with sticks, you know. And uh, they also sometimes were beating people, but some, but frankly speaking, they always do it in big uprisings in, 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 in America or UK or everywhere else. It's not good, but I mean, that's something that still is sort of acceptable in the case of strong, 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 like, you know, uh, for example, riots. There were no riots, but anyway, but nobody, nobody shot. And that's very important. Uh, let me open it up. I'm sure some of you have questions. I, I, I just want to add a little bit more about that. This 2004, 2014. It's only steps. And when you have steps, when you come to the same point, like 1991, 2004, 2014, we come to the same point. We come to the beginning from where we start. What does it mean? It means that the nation is not clear where is it going. It means that we still don't have a clear goal. Because if you have a goal, you know that you, you can have mistakes, but you somehow constantly go to closer, closer, closer to the point you want. Ukraine, I am afraid, is still on the crossroads. There is a famous <coughs> song by famous American Delta blues singer Robert Johnson, which is called Crossroads. I like it. So, <laughs> so, so we are on crossroads, and this crossroads can become shameful and, and, and can become uh, vicious as well. So it, it depends only on us. And if we don't start doing some something, changing our minds, first of all, because that's the core problem and that's the key to all the problems. If we don't start doing that, we will come one day <coughs> to the same thing. Probably with less blood, probably with not. Nobody knows. We still have blood pouring on our streets. We have war, and it's not over. And God knows when it's going to be over. It, it's not an easy story, and it's not a short story. And even when when we come to the end of the story, all wars or revolutions end somehow. But even then, if we don't change our minds, and we, if we don't understand as a nation what is our core 
what are our core principles, values, and where are we going to? Where is our Israel? You know, if we don't know that, we will come <coughs> back to the same and same same mistake. Many years, we will die. Our children, grandchildren, will be grown ups, and they will face the same things before we establish some new deal. You know. Hi, um, my name is is Stephen Redeker, and I run a nonprofit here at Yale. Um, and what I do, what we do, is we work with um, several thousand students in Ukraine. And we'll try to sense this best, incidentally. Oh. <laughs> um, as, and with some Yale students who are over there. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a network over there. And these students, they're all university students. They all feel that they can't leave it to the government, to the politicians, that they have to become proactive, as you said and not just monitor, but actually initiate reforms. But one of the big problems, I'm going to give you a, a, a platform to speak of, is they feel, these students feel, that people in the West, and especially their peers here at Yale and other, many other universities in this country, really don't get it. They really, you, sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to criticize you, but you really don't understand how horrible and how how desperate the situation is over there. And as uh, Mr. Vakachak, sorry, mentioned. Uh, you can say Slava. It's easy. <laughs> okay. oh, everybody called me Slava, just S L A V A. It's very easy. Well, uh, incidentally. It also means glory in Ukraine. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to make this too long, but I, I hadn't heard of you, and I sent an email to uh, to the social network saying, should I go to this lecture? And within within a few hours, I got 300 responses <laughs> <laughs> saying, if you don't go, we're going to quit the network. So, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is they feel that you don't care. And they know that you have all kinds of other things on your plate, and your academics, and we have certainly we have problems in this country. But this is a tip, Ukraine is a tipping point. And what happens there will affect the world because of Russia and because of President Putin. So they want you to try not only to understand, but to help them, help them create this network and help them create a movement over there that could, could get them toward, on the road to survival and to prosperity and hopefully success. So they asked me to ask you to to tell people here why it is important for the United States, for students, to become involved in Ukraine. Thank you for the question. I will surprise you with the first part of the answer. There will be two parts. The first uh, part, they don't, they, there is, they don't need to. It's, it's our Ukrainian business. Nobody else is going uh, there is no reason for somebody else, specific reason, to help you. It's like your family. Certainly you can ask for help. Certainly uh, good people and people with, you know, with heart, they always will come and somehow respond and help, as it happens. But it's your own business. Finally, it's your own business. I'm convinced that problems with Ukraine should and must be solved by Ukraine firstly. And uh, it's a, a little bit humiliating position to come and to, to go all over the world and say, help us, please. We are so, you know, uh, nobody likes us. We are like, a, a, please, we are so poor and desperate. Please help us. I find it humiliating. I never do that in my own private life, in my, uh, in my, in my personal life, in my career. Uh, they always say that, you know, many people say, and I'm always asked by Ukrainian people and journalists about like, how can we live in a country where we can't, um, you know, achieve some some you know some goals we want to achieve? I was given my example. Nobody helped me. Nobody in the world. We started as a very very poor band, living uh, together in one bedroom, uh, uh, like uh, one bedroom flat, and we we're, we're eating like like spaghetti uh, seven days a week because we didn't have any money. And somehow we got to the point we are now. No government, no Americans, no NATO, no uh, international monetary fund. <laughs> Nobody helped me. Nobody. 
So how did I get it? It's the first part, part of the question. Now is the second more, more kind, and I would say more, more something you want from me. To, uh, there is a cynical and practical uh, issue why WEF should help, should help Ukraine. Not because they are, you are so good and you need to help like, in, uh, like they, they teach you in church. No. Just because it's, it's vital for everybody. Because as you absolutely wisely marked, it's a tipping point. Because what is happening now in Ukraine is uh, it never happened after 1945. And 1945, as far as we all know, was the last year of the world turmoil. And finally, after that, we all live in a big, peaceful, in a heavenly peace, you know. Everything is fine. Some little conflicts, some, some small local wars, some bigger local wars, but no world wars. Like, people more or less are living comfort life. Ukraine could be, can, can be a place where that all can start. And here you're right. So what should everybody explain is not that Ukraine needs help. Ukraine somehow will handle, and I think we need to help us with our own hands. But the world needs help. The world needs help. Because Ukraine is just, you know, it's like, uh, it's like a crack on a, a small crack on, on the surface. It could be a part, just a crack, and it, that not, like, if, if it's not your land, that's, that's okay. It's, it's, it's your neighbor's business. It's not my crack. Oh, it's bad? Okay, I will give some concrete to my friend, or I will borrow, or I will uh, like, lend some money, or whatever, you know. But what if this crack is only the beginning of a big earthquake? And then it will come through yours, territory and all destroys and ruins everything. Think of this, of Ukrainian uh, situation and of events of Ukraine as, as a possible beginning of a big earthquake. And then it will be easier for everybody to understand why it's important. I think that many politicians in the world uh, are so reluctant talking about Ukraine or let's say uncertain not because they are, not only because they are weak. Some of them are really weak, that's true. But not only because of that. They never, they never used to live in these conditions, in these situations. They never lived in 1942. They never lived in 1916. They never lived in 1778, or like in America. They live in a more or less comfort life. Politician being brought, uh, being raised or brought up in Yale, Harvard, and any others, the elite, they were living in more or less comfort, not uh, com comfort conditions, not conditions of tipping point. You know, I'm a physicist. Uh, we call tipping points uh, non-analytical points, the points of uh, non, non. You ca you ca you can't count anything. You can't solve equations in this point. There is no, so, there is no solution. The, all solutions are senseless. And when you come to this point, it's too, 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 too late to, to, to act by rules you were taught before. Because these, these rules don't work. You need to create your new rules. In 1941, uh, they created new rules. Or 1939, when, when the New World War started. In 1914, they created new rules. There were no rules before like that. Uh, coming, coming, coming even further to history, you, you all remember the Westphalian system, when before this, everybody fought everybody, like in Hobbes Le 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 Leviathan. Yeah, Leviathan. Everybody fought everybody. That was the first time when people decided to sit down and to talk how it should be, uh, everything should be worked out to be negotiable. and to be stable. 
And they did it not because they were kind, they, because nobody could fought each other finally. I mean, there was no somebody, there was no stronger or weaker. Everybody were like the same and 30 years war exhausted everybody. So let us not come to this point and start doing something before. That's what I would say to all who do not understand why Ukraine is important. Because when, when we have an argument, just help us because we want to be a part of Europe. Bullshit. No. Nobody, nobody cares. No, no. Help us because, uh, because uh, we have, uh, like, you know, our eco economy is sinking and we have, like, so many poor people. Africa has much worse. Uh, help us because, like, because what? So this is the real point that people all over the world not only could but should be attracted with. It is a tipping point, and here I completely agree with you. So once again, I divide the answer for two into questions. Don't help Ukraine. Help yourself, and then Ukraine will be in good conditions, and we'll, ha we'll have a possibility to help ourselves. May I rephrase that? Instead of help, how about join us? Yeah, probably yes, join us. Oh, that's a very interesting topic. I can talk hours and hours about that. It's just only mm -hmm. probably top, top of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg. Yeah, tip, tip of the iceberg. Yeah. I can say, not, not because I'm not allowed to. It's just, mm -hmm. don't want to blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> <laughs> it's not to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Alina? Um, okay, yeah, so, so since we're on the question of um, helping and or joining Ukraine from the Western perspective, I'm just curious, what do you yourself believe an effective, um, like, aid? Or just what would constitute help? Education. Mm -hmm. Education, um, education, 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 education. Number one, number two, number three, number four, <laughs> top ten, education. Okay, so education of people in Ukraine. Education of people in Ukraine, within Ukraine. Education of people in Ukraine, abroad. Edu coming, Ukrainian students come here. Edu uh, foreign teachers and lecturers come there. Uh, you make programs for youngsters from, from kids from kindergartens. You should start from kindergartens, not from universities. It's very late. I'm, for, I'm, I'm sorry for many Ukrainians who are here, like Yale students, but I think it's even too late to start to become a different person uh, just when you come in your 18 or 19 or 20 here. You need to start from being three or four. And, and it's very good that some of parents already understand that and starting to changing life of their children, like, like giving them a new perspective now. But I think education, is, it's, it's a crucial thing. Uh, but it's the, 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 the bad, new, bad news is all I'm talking about are very strategical and slowly working. But the problem is with the, without them, we can't achieve something you know, before we become, our elite becomes open-minded and educated and not narrow-minded and parochial, nobody, nothing happens before that. So what do you mean by becoming a new person? Like, just in terms of civic engagement? Or, like, what, what is, how, how do I phrase this? How should Ukrainian people, like, what should they strive to become? No, it's very, it's very difficult. Uh, to convince somebody to change their mind if they are happy with what they have. But somehow you need to. To change their mind from like not caring about like, being involved the, 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 the biggest, biggest problems with Ukrainians are irresponsibility, the fear to, to how to say this, the fear to, to lose the small thing you have <coughs> and not eagerness to eagerness to to achieve something bigger just you know we have uh, I don't know how to translate probably there is a, a relevant pro pro proverb in in English uh, if you have this in English you can yes. just uh, two kinds of birds if you if you keeping the very speedy birds and very slow birds with flying very slow much better to keep to keep the quick birds in the hand 
then look for the bird that flying very, very, very slow. And that comes. Sorry, but yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's something like that. So there is no relevant proverb, proverb in English. Okay. Yes, I'm not yeah. professional about yeah. Sorry. So uh, uh, having said that, I mean that that this is a very difficult, a very, very difficult task. I'm and 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 goal. I'm I'm putting here in front of you to educate the whole nation or to change the mind of the whole nation is something that takes generations and you need to put extremely huge efforts to do that but I don't believe that there is other way if you give me other way I'll be happy just give me the new recipe I'll, I'll be happy to join you they say no new weapon no money from IMF nothing of that will solve the problem that can help shortly, tactically, certainly, they can, that, that can be helpful. But strategically, it doesn't work. I'll, I'll give you, a, we shortly discussed with Mark, uh, uh, Israel, Israeli topic in, in the cafe. So I, I want to say about, I like this example very much. Not because we are somehow uh, similar with Israel. No, I don't think so. But there are many things that are similar, like s some specific things. You know that uh, why, uh, what I like in Jewish history, that they created their own very powerful weapon to, to like, fight all the enemies. At the beginning, this nation was, uh, or the, the tribes who formed this nation were the weakest in the region. They were always conquered by others, beaten by others because they were small, living in a relatively, I would say, not relatively, but just mm, how you call it, hostile territory, and sadly, uh, from, from the point of view of, of climate as well, there was just desert there, nothing else. So they was, were always defeated, and def defeated, and, and before they created the best weapon they had, the word, the book, the principles. So this is something that keeps people together as a, as a big, big family. No matter where do they live, no matter, no matter what do they do, no matter how strong are they suppressed, they just feel right. Because they know there are some principles that from the very beginning of their life were like, uh, how you call like implemented within them and uh, and then help this nation to exist even without a country for five or more thousand years and then finally to find their own country and now to uh, to to be surrounded for like let's say not only friends uh, to to successfully live and finally in the become one of the most prosperous countries in the world, starting from nothing. No big territory, no big amount of people, uh, no big army at the very beginning, just the desire and the principles, the book. So what I say Ukrainian need, we need our own book. I mean, the book from capital B. That's something that makes you stronger than any money, uh, weapon, uh, because the principles, you can't, yeah, the principles, you, 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 what, what can you do with principles? Nothing. Money, they evaporate. Weapon, you can fight with, with bigger weapons or more effective <coughs> weapons. But the principles, you can't do nothing with them, the values. Afterwards, I think Western civilization somehow, somehow uh, made it work for them Two, these, these principles that were first great, uh, presented in the Bible, they went through Christianity to Western world as well, and to what you have here in the United States. These are principles, simple things that my freedom or freedom of choice and my dignity is the most important thing, and I'm ready to, to die for that. And what happened, what bad thing that happened, but with a good, let's say, impact, the first death in Maidan in Ukraine showed 
it was a tragedy, but this tragedy showed that people were willing to die for their freedom. freedom. And that's the beginning of something new. Because when you are willing to die for your principles, that means that you have these principles, that they are your fundamental things. Because you can, you can bring your flags and transparency and say, okay, I'm for freedom. But it's nothing before you give something very precious. And what is more <coughs> precious than life? People were ready to give up their life, uh, to give away their life just, just for their principles. And that's, while being, a tra while being a tragedy, still makes me more optimistic. Because I think that's something that we can start from. And uh, it can take... It can take us 40 years as Jewish from to go from, from Egypt land. It can take us probably hundreds of years. But I am convinced that it's the only way to change our mind. If we do not do that, we will be coming back and forth in the same place. Somebody will, sitting, will be sitting in this room in 30 years and explaining why the next Maidan occurred and why we still need money from IMF and weapon from, from the United States Army. Do you not think that the people who, because at least from my perspective and having, you know, read the news and watched videos online and stuff, people who are, um, who believe that they're defending Donetsk and those regions also believe that they hold the principles of, you know, fighting for freedom and putting their lives on the line to gain freedom? Good question. Good question. Now, now, now we come to a little different point. That what we were talking about was my dad. Okay. So... The things we were discussed, we were discussed why this uprising, why this revolution occurred in Ukraine. What we're talking about now is much more complicated thing. There is so much of how we how do we call it now, hybrid war or hybrid war when when there is not only weapon but also information uh, involved and uh, propaganda and everything like that. So probably it's uh, the first ever war that happens like that in the world. Probably they will, I hope there will be no war in the future, but I unfortunately understand they will. So probably next wars will be like that, hybrid wars. Not only weapons, tanks or bullets, but first of all, internet, newspapers, TV, yeah, publicity. And that was the most influential weapon, which... Uh, caused things happened in Eastern Ukraine. My opinion is the following. For many years, nobody from politicians cared what, go what was going on in the Eastern Ukraine. Not only economically, because economically they didn't care not only in, <laughs> in East, they didn't care at all. But also uh, mentally or we call it ideological. Ide ideological. Because ideology in Ukraine somehow was in, somehow was defined by what the most Western and uh, Central Ukraine accepted. Eastern Ukraine probably never accepted it too deeply, but it was okay, like equilibrium. Nobody cared. They didn't care. The government <coughs> didn't care. They lived like, you know, they didn't see each other. It's like uh, sometimes in bad families, I'm sorry to give this example, but, but when husband and wife, they don't sleep each other, uh, with each other, but still live together, because first of all, they need to live. <laughs> Second, they just, it's easier to live together than, 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 than separate. And they even live in different bedrooms, but somehow, you know, it was like that. The problem of, the problem of, of the Ukrainian government, and I blame all Ukrainian governments for all these 23 years. They, I don't know, uh, club, no, no, correct and polite words in English to say that <laughs> they don't get, you don't get it. <laughs> yeah. 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 They don't get it now. So, 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 uh, now what happened? The propaganda started working even before Maidan. But Maidan was strongly showed as something anti-Donbass, anti-Donbass.
the Nets and the Eastern European. People, although they probably have different opportunities to, to see different points of view, but they never intended to choose. They, they didn't have this, this uh, value of choosing something. No? Open mind. Open mind. And that's the same, but that's the same disease for Eastern and Western Ukrainians. I don't blame only one part. But that part was so strongly implanted. They didn't choose what's true, what not. They accepted only one part. So, what happened next? Next were many strategical mistakes from, from both sides, but I blame Ukrainian government for something they didn't do from the very beginning. On the 1st of March, 1990, uh, sorry, 2014, I was in the net in the university. It, it's like, <coughs> no, a year ago, talking to students, there they were like five, no, no, not 500, like 1,500 people. So 500 people in a big, big auditorium, and next 1,000 staying, uh, mm. there were big loudspeakers, and like PA, and they were mm. sitting outside listening. There were all the Ukrainian flags, not all, but some of them. And it was truly pro-Ukrainian meeting. Although there was a good argument, some of them were disagreed, disagreed with what was going on in Kiev, but it was an argument, probably like hours now. So some people had different, they had second thoughts. But not, I didn't see any intention of, like, I didn't see any, any bad signs there. All happened in the next two, three, four weeks, and was prepared before. And the problem that probably we undervalue, underestimated it, I mean, he underestimated it. So I don't think that now, People in this war, they fight for, for freedom. They fight for, for their point of view, from both sides. Fight for freedom was in Maidan. <coughs> now it's not fight for freedom. Now it's fight for, for the point of view. Uh, for me, it's obvious that my country, is a, if I want it to be safe, need to preserve and to keep its territory. That's why um, I understand that for Ukraine, this war is like, like it's very, it's 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 a very bad war, you know. And uh, I don't blame people living in Donbas, and never will. They have their thoughts. They are who they are, and the worst way to talk to them is weapons and guns. But sometimes. When somebody with weapons and guns comes to your place and to your country and to your territory and says it will be mine now, do you have any other choice? I don't think so. So what should be done now? It's a very clever and step-by-step -step precise process of re rebuilding normal negotiations. Even not, not rebuilding it, a state as a whole of negotiations. Because now it came too far. It won't be very easy. But I strongly believe that the best way to handle with it is for Ukraine is to make the safe part of Ukraine becoming developed mm -hmm. more and more mm -hmm. quickly, quickly. It's the easiest, the safest, and the most... Uh, not the easiest, the safest and the most effective. effective. Not, the, not effective. the easiest. Effective. Probably the most difficult. Mm -hmm. But the most effective, <clears throat> you never convince somebody with the help on the barrel of a gun. You convince somebody, showing them something better. And it's, it's interesting, because it always works. It was, by the way, it was, by the way, uh, a tactics of a former Chinese empire. Confusion, confusion thing. They never... When, when big enemies came, they never tried to conquer them and to come and to get new territories. They always assimilated. <laughs> they made Mongols, Manjurians, I don't probably I don't spell it correctly in English, but you understand I'm, I'm talking. Uh, 
They co-opted them. Yeah, right. They made them part of Chinese because they were better developed, uh, high educated, and everybody was so awed by that. So they just, wow, it's better. We choose this way. That's what Ukraine can do now. I don't believe we can do something else. To, to do that, first we need to change our minds. Because you can't change your economy with, without fighting, absolutely fighting corruption. Or you can't fight corruption without changing your mind. Because corruption is not something, it's not mentality, you know? They sometimes say it's mentality. I don't believe, for me, mentality is bullshit. I'm sorry. I will explain you why. It's just rules, accepted or not accepted. Somebody should, should come and have cuts to, to change this rule, to break them, to, to make them completely different. You, you change completely the rules here 230, 50 years ago. They were different. The uh, English Empire rules were different, but you change them here. Like many other countries, you just need to change it. It will, it will take some time. And don't talk about mentality, because I always put one example. Korea. Do South and North Koreans possess different mentality? It's the same nation. 70 years ago, it was the same nation. It, the, what, it, they, have, they share common grandfather, grandfather, grandmother. It's the same nation. Do they have different mentality? No. Look at these two countries. So does it have to do something about mentality? No. It has to do about rules, established rules, which the majority accept. But in order to get them this rule accepted, you need to to give examples to make it. it should be a sort of uh, a mixture of uh, of missionaryism, of propaganda, of in good words, of uh, in good sense of subtle words, of self example, of, of everything. It doesn't work differently. The same, the same others, you know. So when when they say, okay, Ukrainians have different mentality, we we never can be Scandinavians or Americans. Okay, Americans. What is a nationality from a, from I mean from a point of view of your origin or blood or something? Do they have such a nationality? Americans. Americans is a mixture of different people. They have so many different people here. Ukrainians also built this country. Irish, Jewish, English, French, Germans, many, many, many countries from all over the world. They all built this country. Do they have the same mentality? No. If we talk about mentality. But did they succeed somehow? Yes, because they had rules. There were, there were, there were clear rules, clear ideas made by the founders that people accepted, and somehow it managed to work. That's it. Gandhi's wife said once yeah. that the problem is, the biggest problem is that uh, no one actually wants to be as good as you are. Well, she meant Gandhi himself. So oh. do you think the uh, majority of Ukrainians are, are actually willing to become better or change? Don't think so. Good question. <laughs> Don't think so today. But it's, uh, that doesn't make me pessimistic. Because you always work step by step. Once again to history. Sorry for for, I just like giving these examples because I think that two fundamental things in the world are physics, which rules all the world, and history, which rules only hu uh, us human beings. That's why I like that. Uh, uh, the, the beginning of Christianity, who treated it seriously? Nobody. Just these people were treated as fools, as weirdos. Like, nobody... They just people laughed at them. They 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 brought something new, different. People didn't like it, but somehow it worked. Step by step, step. good rules when they're good, they will attract more and more people. Why? Because they 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 are they, they are helpful and, and they're working. You know, working. Mahatma Gandhi is a good example. He not he he is a single person, but he probably was the most responsible for, for building Indian nation. There was no Indian nation as it is. There was no Indian, there was not, not such a notion as Indian nation. There was, there were many, many kingdoms 
or uh, like uh, from, how how they call it? Uh, no, 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 caste, no kingdoms. No, 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 different kingdoms ruled by different different rajas and maharajas. Uh, some and different countries, even with different religions. More or less, they were gathered by British authority as a colony. So, these people like Nehru, like Gandhi, they created a country. Somehow, they managed to do this. In 1947, somehow they didn't, they didn't succeed 100% because after that, the bloody war occurred between Muslims and, and Hindus. But, okay, they made three countries. Bangladesh, <coughs> Pakistan, and, and, and India. But still, there are the created nation from the very beginning. One billion of people didn't think of themselves as a whole nation, and now they do. So it's easy to make within one, two, or three generations. Don't say Ukrainians who already understand that they're a nation, they already share somehow some principles, probably not all of them are like, working, but still. I think we have good chances. You're a, famous, uh, you're a famous person and definitely an Athenian leader. So how do you see your social role uh, in the post-revolution Ukraine? Thank you for the question. First of all, I am I never understand why they say why they say that I'm I was a leader of one of the leaders of Maidan. I went there as an ordinary person, probably as an inspiration. I okay because a lot of my music and things like that. But personally, I was in Maidan almost every day, but was on the stage only twice. No, once, when singing with my world band. For three months, only once I was on the stage. So there were many other leaders. Why they say I was leader, I don't know. I didn't want to be leader, and I don't, don't think that I was the leader. Only once I went on the stage. Uh, yeah, what I did, just wrote songs and sang them and somehow brought some stuff to Maidan and as ordinary people who was there, just standing in, in the crowd. By the way, it was uh, my the only experience of staying in the crowd for so long. Never I did it before, and I don't know if I do it, if I'll do it more. It's, I felt how people feel in our concerts, you know, standing in the crowd. I was standing in the crowd there many times. <laughs> and so w what is interesting, when you're staying in the crowds, like, like that, nobody uh, cares who you are. So people noticed me, somehow greeted, but but nobody was like annoying me with autographs or photos <laughs> or anything like that. When in normal time I go somewhere just on the street, I'm stopped like ten times in in in, in a minute. So everybody wants to stop to have an <coughs> autograph, to photo, but then in the crowd, people know who you are. Just you're just a part of, of this process. Nobody thinks that you are better or worse. You're just one of million, and that's great. So I don't think that somebody, when I was saying, standing in the crowd listening to these leaders of Maidan who were staying on the stage, I don't think anybody asked me for a photo or autograph for five or six times I was on Sundays I was there. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. My role. I want to, to sing and to compose music. That's my ego egoistic, egoistic desire. Because there is nothing more, more powerful, there is no more powerful core in my life than, than arts, than, than music. And I want to, to, to remain musician to, till the end of my life. But I understand that sometime you need to 
uh, to give more. Even you know, you it's not that you need. There is something within myself that says me, okay, it's not enough. You need to do something else. So if I need it in some other role, I'm ready for that. We'll be happy if politics will stay inside. But I don't predict the future. I don't, know. I don't predict. If I need, if, if people need me in, in the other role, probably I will. So oh, I wanted to ask about, uh, uh, or like economical, uh, like like association in the world, because GDP of European Union is even bigger than the United States. So I mean, I can't respect them, and can't accept the fact that it's great to to live in such a community. But I don't think that Ukraine is ready for that. Uh, <coughs> and we need to be honest. I'm not a politician to, to stay in the tribune and say that our goal is to become your, your member of the European Union. What is behind that? What is behind the scene? Uh, before, what I want to say that before stating this question consciously, we need to become richer than we are now. That's what I mean. When we become richer, when we become at, at least, or somebody probably will say, oh, it's a big goal, but still, as rich, as prosperous as Poland, or Czech Republic, <coughs> or these countries, then what, I know Ukraine well, I, I'm traveling a lot. Believe me, difference between two local people sitting, being neighbors in the same region, some, sometimes are bigger than than differences between people in different regions. Uh, some people think older, some, some people think more contemporary, newer. This is how nation is divided, much more seriously than just regional things. I know many people from Eastern Ukraine, from Donetsk and other, who are so, there are many friends of mine, some of them are now refugees in, in, in Kyiv. They are so bright, so you, like pro-European, so pro, you say, like, like people completely with the same values as I am. And, I'm, and I also know many strange and very, you know, old-fashioned and narrow-minded people in Western Ukraine. So that's not the only question of, of regional difference. Although diff re regional difference is important, but <coughs> I always say that there are many things that unify all Ukraine. Corruption, for example. <laughs> that, that, yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, yeah. Ukraine, all Ukraine, there is no regional difference. All Ukraine is being corrupted very, very homogeneously. From, <laughs> absolutely. And man, there are many other things, you know? Bad things as well as good things. I think that being corrupted, Ukrainians somehow still are very uh, hard-working nations. Ukrainian nation is nation that likes to work. Okay, probably I would say not likes to work, but can work hard. <laughs> no, no, it's very important because I know many other, some other nations that are really easy, easy going. You know, I wouldn't name them, but <laughs> but but they are easy going, and you can see the, the result as well. Ukrainians are not easy going nation because. For, for many many hundreds of years, they were ruled by others, and they were suppressed, and there was a, like the peasants were almost in slavery, so they know how, how to work hard. The problem is they don't know how to think hard. Probably, probably we have tradition. Usually, when you will, when their time is is over, then we have last three questions. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very, it's, it's, it's very, it's fair enough because then, then everybody's get, get, get ready to, that it's the end. I have a comment and a question. The comment about the European Union, it, it's not a question of choosing. Do you want to become part of the European or not? 
I think it's a question of deciding to go in that direction in a process way. Remember, Poland and Romania and all these countries, when they signed the association agreement and when they eventually uh, joined the EU officially and NATO eventually, it was a process. And the Europeans, the European Union as it was expanding, was constantly providing assistance, was constantly giving advice. You know, Jeffrey Sachs dropped into Poland and did a, you know, a crash reformation of the economy. Um, you know, there are now, uh, uh, I, our priest is, uh, comes from Romania, and he was telling us stories about how uh, when the association agreement with Romania was signed, about how uh, advisors would come in to reconstitute the constitutional court, and about how judges were removed, and some of them were imprisoned. And this was done under the impetus of the European guidelines in order to become a full-fledged member of the European Union. So these countries didn't choose to become part of the European Union. They chose to take a path which eventually qualified them for admission. So I that, never argued with that. I completely agree with it. And that's what your grant should do as well. But my question is, is really different. I want to change the focus. You are in Ukraine, you travel, you visit, uh, you talk to people. There's a new president, there's a new government, a new parliament. Uh, it's fairly new, so you can't expect dramatic changes in this uh, short time frame. But what is the feeling of the people, and what is your impression of progress or lack of progress? Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I usually don't like answering these kind of questions because my personal attitude to life is never expect anything from anyone. So, like, I always live like that. So, when people ask me, is this or that president good or bad, I always say, I never asked him to do something for me. So, so I don't know. So, but I, I'll try to, to answer anyway. So, because my personal thing is, I don't care who is the president. I do my job. And I want everybody of my country mates act the same. But the majority, unfortunately, that's what I want to change in, in minds of our people. The majority is just waiting, 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 waiting. They're waiting for Messiah. They're waiting for, but uh, uh, unlikely as in Bible, they're waiting for Messiah that should certainly come while they're living. Not in the in the next in the next life, yeah. Just today, a messiah, a bad, a good tsar or king, a great president. Uh, always, I hear the words: We need Václav Havel, we need Mahatma Gandhi, we we need George Washington, we need who else? We need William the Conqueror. Who who do we need? We need Moses. We uh, everything. Just people people say we need, we need, we need. Why don't you become one of them? If you say we need, just do your job. So uh, my own expectations were never high. That's why I'm not neither disappointed nor charmed. You know? So I'm okay. Uh, I, I'm doing my job. Uh, the expectation of people, I think, is people are disappointed. Uh, but I would put blame half for the new establishment, for the government, and for people. Because suddenly the reforms that were being, that were announced are not ma being made. Uh, for different reasons. Lack of political will, lack, uh, as we say, lack of guts, lack of expertise, the war in the country, uh, Combination of all these factors, a lot of uh, of old working machine that somehow they try to change now. If it's true, they try to get new people in from abroad. You know, we have Lithuanians, Georgians. They want to bring. We have our finance minister. She's American. I I I know she's a good acquaintance of mine. I know her, Natalia Rescu. and. Uh, 
unfortunately for yourself, a Howard uh, <laughs> diploma, <laughs> not Yale, but anyway. But anyway, uh, uh, so, so something is being done. But people also need to understand that it's, it's, it's their contribution. It's their contribution. So if you're not satisfied, try doing yourself something. So you, 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 have you been to Ukraine, no? No, you, you, you know. So there is a simple example. Okay, the city of Kiev doesn't have money to, to change or to, re, to repair roads properly. But okay, do you need to have special money to keep the place near your house or condominium clean of garbage? Do you need a special money for that? No, you just need to be accurate. You need to be like hardworking. You need to be just to, to like the rule. You just have your garbage, get your garbage thrown into a proper place. Why don't you see this picture in Kiev? So when it starts from garbage on the street, it means that people don't care. And that doesn't mean that somebody doesn't have money. When, believe me, I'm 100% sure, when you come to the city and you see no garbage in the street at all, mm. that means, that means that something changed. That's the first step. After that, somehow, miracle, you'll find money for changing roads, then for changing educational system, then for changing government, and you should start from yourself. You pointed uh, Poland and Romania. I've never been to Romania, actually I've been to only like a small child visiting to Bulgaria, but never been to Romania, but I know Poland well, because I, I, I was brought up in, in a border with Poland, so I speak Polish. And, uh, this was already nation with a good notion of their future at the 1990 or the 1989. They were already ready. They were poor. They were like the rules didn't work. The economy was ruined, but they knew what they wanted. That's different with Ukraine. That's why we need this. Why that happened? There are many reasons, and now we can come to the twilight zone, murky things. I'm even not ready to discuss publicly with, with being recorded because mm -hmm. there are some controversial things. I have my thoughts. Why? Why? What's the difference? But I would say generally, more diplomatically, different historical development. And now we, also our, how you say this, <coughs> our threshold is much higher than theirs. We need to, to the efforts we need to, to, to bring are much bigger than Poles today because of the history. First of all, they had a lot of time, they had their own country, nation, and you know, their state, state, I mean state, that, that, that gives you a lot. And many other things. <coughs> Ukrainians were divided between two empires, and some say that one empire was bad, another was good. I never think that there is good empire when you are just a part of a, a colony in, in the country. There's no, never good or bad empire. All empires are bad if you're a colony. <laughs> yeah, but, but in one part of, of Ukraine, the rules were, were more strict, in another less. In Western Ukraine, they, helped, they, they somehow presented Ukrainian culture. I don't think that because Austrians were more kind or polite, just because the politics of this empire was not, they didn't care on national identities, they would care about different things. Russian empire was different, they wanted to assimilate. So just, it happened like that. Uh, but even even language, I know that the majority of Ukrainians here are patriots and the language issue for you is very vital, but believe me, even language is not the most important nation. Irish, Irish almost lost their language. They are one of the strongest nations I've seen. They're a great nation. I've been to, I mean, Gallic once again. So. The important is your values. Once again, values, values, and values. 
and not but values doesn't mean only get us on set pepper today it's something more <laughs> the two uh, one if, two if, if i may yeah. segueing to that slava um the question um pertaining to poland and ukraine uh poland had a very strong leader in its uh, workforce left lesson and he became a symbol of the future and belief in your opinion do you think that Ukraine lacks the leadership that it needs to move forward with a value system, a rule of law, right. etc.? And um, before I conclude with my question, I will share a story that may put this into perspective very quickly. Um, there's a very famous meeting that took place with Leonid Makarovich Kruchuk and the former U.S. ambassador Roman Popoduk, who was the first ambassador to Ukraine. And Popoduk asked Kruchuk the question, Leonid Makarovich, why couldn't you effectuate change? And he answered the question very simply. He said, when I would come to the office on Monday morning, I would have a red phone and a black phone on my desk. At 10 o'clock every Monday, the red phone rang. Okay, August 25th, 1991, he comes to the office, right, and the red phone's not ringing. And it's 10 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock, and it's 12 o'clock. So Popoduk says, why don't you just pick up the black phone and tell people what to do? Because Moscow gave you orders, and you were implementing. And he said, I didn't know what to say. It's a true story. I was present at that meeting. So is there a leadership issue that is, is problematic in Ukraine? Thank you very much. Uh, it reminds me, the previous question I, did, I forgot to answer properly. There was a question about movement bottom up and top down uh, yeah we, we had a discussion in Cambridge and it was an argument mm -hmm. uh, a hard talk I would say <laughs> so uh, I think it's a reciprocal uh, process so uh, you need to do both the society by the way when I'm talking about society I don't mean all citizens in the country because in every country civil society it's just 10 to 15 percent what we call elite or how you call it, active society it's the same in America in France in China everywhere you don't have hundred percent people involved I think even here you have 15 percent people who care no, like it's it's true yeah other are happy be, be, with what these 15 people are giving to them. and it's normal way of living in the world but so these 15 people per percent of people should start a process bottom up but without having a reciprocal way from top down you won't succeed so suddenly I think we need a leader probably we need today and that's something probably not very popular among Democrats but Probably we need some very strong leader, uh, not as much democratic as probably some people in America might mm -hmm. might uh, expect. Mm -hmm. Sa having said that, I'm not uh, talking about you know uh, Robespierre or Stalin. No, <laughs> no, no, certainly. Uh, but somebody who probably would. How to put it correctly? Okay, there is something how it should be done, okay, on on the red phone, and on the red, on the black phone, there is something that probably shouldn't be done, but you're sure that that's the only way you need to do, and you need to take black. Phone. We need <laughs> these kind of people. Uh, as I'm not an official politician, I can say some words that probably. Uh, could, could treat me as a politician political hooligan but but I can't do it I don't care uh, I don't believe in rules in the world I believe in in how you call it in negotiations or if we have rules it's not rules given by God or somebody it's something that we decided to live with so it's just decision of many people so if if some rules are wrong do different uh, they say okay you should so if I were if I were the leader of the country I certainly would care 
what the world says, but much more I would care what I think is right for my country. And that's one more thing with, with, with what I like in Israel. They, I not always agree with what they do, especially when there is very tricky uh, Middle East issue and there is no right or bad solution. There's always different things. But I always like how their elite works. They just don't care. What, uh, are, are you, everybody else? Not because they are so arrogant, but because they know that finally it's their business. And if they screw, it's their problem. If they succeed, succeed is their achievement. Nobody else is there to help them or to blame or to, to, to work for or against. And, and that's the way we need, to, in Ukraine, we need to live. I don't see the guys there who, who, who act like that. I, I appreciate how uh, the uh, present president works with the international community now. It's much, much better than it was before. Suddenly he does the best he can. But still, but still, you, you go and ask for help. Don't ask for help do something and then people will come and respect you do something show that you are a strong man do something okay and the last one and the last one no oh great no question <laughs> A, st a statement in, in support of that. An official one? An official <laughs> statement. <laughs> no, because I actually uh, spent the better part of the last two years in Ukraine, in Kyiv. I was part of Maidan from the beginning. I was at your December 15th mm -hmm. concert with, and the way you... And lights, Senator McCain was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, and he made he made a selfie from all of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so no, there, I'm not joking. It's true. I'm sure. <laughs> and there was the question in terms of what role can you play. And one of the things I found, um, because that was also the height of the anti Maidan. Mm -hmm. And I remember when you were on stage, and you are an all encompassing force. Where it was some of the ones from the anti Maidan. Yeah. We're sitting somewhere further up, but we, we reserve special place for them. Exactly. Yeah. And we're also fans of Okinawa. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so I think that in itself is your, you know, just the you as a person in the band and everybody is a unifying force for whether again every the East, the West, the languages so is very much artificially. It was when the polit politicians needed it, it became an issue. And so the way you finished, I know when I'm in Ukraine, one of the things I've always because people will always ask. What should the U.S. do? What should this do? And I said, you know, Ukraine needs to finally, not what Russia wants, not what the EU wants, not what America wants, Ukraine needs to do what's good for Ukraine. And it could be bits and pieces from each of these. And I think it's slowly... And you know, and you, and you know what? Thank you for, for this statement. And you know what? When you're starting doing proper, correct thing, things for your country, Everybody will be dissatisfied. <laughs> Everybody. You won't please anybody. Believe me, the way, when there will be the day, Russia, EU, and the US, all of them will be like, okay, it's not something that, that we want you to do. That's the way you do correct. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking Father. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. I, I like. Uh, uh, it was an honor for me be, to be here and to speak to you. And like, uh, it's not, it's it's a little bit like secret, but uh, I don't know if it's correct that I can tell it. But I'm probably if if if, if they allow me to come, probably I'll come here for a couple of months in in autumn uh, here to Yale. Still don't know if they accept me, but probably. <laughs> so if something that I already know, many of you, if, if, if I'm asked, I say, I know many people here. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, and the campus, I liked it, and the gallery, and everything. So probably we'll still check out some, some place here. We're leaving at eight, so. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming and listening. This, this is very important. For me, this conversation is not less important uh, then our concert in the Hammerstein in New York two or three days before for 10,000 people. So, so this is as much important because this is something uh, 
I reflect with you. It's not only that I answer your questions or or I like I practice my English. <laughs> I, I reflect and I see that and I see from, from your responses from your eyes that I think correct. That that we we should stop the uh, how there's there's a good English word. No. Nate, no. Uh -huh. yeah, not complain, it's different. It's like like whining. 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 No, we should stop doing that. <laughs> that's, that that's true. And uh, and once again I'm I'm very open to to any help you need from myself or connections or you were told you told me about your network and everybody else. So so let's let's be in touch. Uh, now or via email or or you can come to our concerts. Unfortunately, the US concerts, so far, we we, we, we stopped with, with coming here. Probably next is Europe and Ukraine. Probably in a year or two, we'll come with, as musicians, but probably I'll come here earlier as, as mentioned. I don't know. Thank you.